unite our hearts together in prayer and let's pray. Our Lord and God, we give thanks that you did delight to hear your people pray, that you have great done great wonders of righteousness for us, that you have sent Jesus into the world to live as we are unable to live and to, de- to die as we deserve in order that we may be redeemed, in order that we might become the children of God, in order that we may be forgiven of our sins and reconciled unto you. Lord God, we give thanks for the wonder of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We give thanks that he is all who he was promised to be and that he embodied all that you are. He was the exact representation of God the Father in human form. Lord, we give thanks that as he came into the world that he brings and embodies your truth, that truth that is still in our hands today as we open the pages of scripture that living and active word that speaks into the very core of who we are and what we yearn for most, that word that informs our lives and our hearts, that word that is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Lord God, we give thanks that we have your inspired and your inerrant word, and we pray that we would live according to it, not just as individuals, but as churches, as congregations, as denominations. Lord God, we pray for the highest court of our church this week as it meets, as it convenes in General Assembly in Edinburgh. We pray, Lord God, your spirit to be with those who uh, gather there and for all of the business that is transacted, some of it mundane, some of it on the surface boring, and yet all of it necessary for the operation of your church and for the propagation of the gospel out into the world. Lord God, we live in a nation that was once known as the land of the book, We no longer live in those times. We live in a country which has turned its back on you. 
we live amongst a generation who are ignorant to you and who are disinterested and apathetic towards your word and your principles. Lord God, we pray that you would help your people, we who profess your name, to live as salt and light in the world, to be distinct, to be loving, to be caring, but to be courageous and forthright in standing for that which is good and that which is true. Or that we would look to you, that we would fix our eyes on you and that you would lead and that you would guide us, that we would see that you are the one and only, that you are unique, and that you are the only begotten Son of God, and that in you and through you we find life, we find light, we find life abundant both here on earth and in eternity to come. We remember at this time, Lord God, those who are faced with particularly difficult providence within their lives. We pray that you would draw alongside them and keep them. We think particularly of Heather Ackroyd this morning, who's unwell, uh, suffering with sarcoma, cancer of the lung. Uh, we pray for her in the, the treatment that has not been working, but we pray for the new treatment that is being trialed this week. And we pray, Lord God, that your grace would be upon her and that you would be with Bob also. Remember others who are going through trials and struggles that are unseen and unknown, but known to you. Lord God, we give thanks that you are the one who sticks closer than a brother, that you are the one who is a friend regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Lord God, we give thanks for uh, the universality of your church, for its universal nature, that we are different people from different areas and different places with different experiences. And yet as we come together, we have that bond in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we give thanks for uh, Tim's time here and uh, Alipul on his sabbatical. We pray that that would be uh, refreshing to his soul and to his mind, uh, that it would be restful to his body, that he would leave here rejuvenated. Uh, we give thanks for uh, John and Sharon with us today and we pray that you would bless and keep them as they enjoy the wonder of your creation and as we all look up, as we behold the work of your hands and the majesty of the part of the world that you have placed us, we give thanks that you have work and you have done wondrous things in our eyes. So we pray that you would bless us in this service of worship and that all that is done would be pleasing to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Mercy. 
read this morning from John's Gospel in chapter 1. Uh, we've recently started a study in John's Gospel under the theme of belief, a journey through John. That's John's expressed purpose in writing his Gospel, that we may believe and that by believing in Jesus we may have life. So we're going to read the first 18 verses. This is classed as the prologue, so the entrance. It's really before he starts his, gospels, uh, his Gospel account in earnest. Uh, but this is where he begins to introduce to us the person of Jesus. This is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. Just a wee caveat here, remember, John is introducing us to John the Baptist. He's not talking about himself. John the Baptist, he himself was not the light. He came only as a, as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received Grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his own holy and inspired word to us. Let's again just unite our hearts together and pray before we turn back. Lord, we recognize that as we come before you in worship this morning that we have failed you. We recognize that regardless of where we are on the spectrum of belief, regardless of where we find ourselves on the spectrum of faith, that this week we have failed you, that perhaps this morning we have failed you, both in thought, in word, and in deed that we are sinful, that we are broken, that as hard as we may try, we cannot keep up the facade of righteousness because our heart betrays us. And so, Lord, we rejoice this morning afresh in the wonder of grace, in the beauty of grace, in the worth of grace that is ours in and through the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has vanquished death who has overcome sin, who has placated uh, or met your justice in order that we might be spared that 
in order that we might become your children, that we may be given the right to be called the children of God, not merely the created of God, not merely your creation, not merely made in your likeness, but your children adopted into your heavenly family, given a place in your eternal kingdom, to know an inheritance that is imperishable, to have a place with you for all of time. Lord, as we look around, we know that our hearts betray us in in different ways, as we are led in the, the way of the world, the pursuit of wealth, the desire for success and respect and fame. Lord, we know that there is a yearning within us for many different things, that there is idol, there are idols that are in our hearts, things that we place on the throne of our lives, things that we aspire to, people, places, belongings. May we recognize, Lord God, that all of these things will pass away, but that you remain, that you are unchanging, that you are steadfast, that you are eternal, that you are the one who is and was and is yet to come, that you are from everlasting and to everlasting, that in the beginning you were, and yet you have come. You have come to us as your people, as your creation. You have sent to us your one and only Jesus, your one and only Son, the begotten of God the Father, in order that you may redeem us to yourself. Buy us back at a great price. And so, Lord, we pray that we would delight in that this morning as we recognize our own frailty, as we recognize our own fragility, as we recognize our own brokenness, that we would revel all the more in the wonder of the love, the mercy, and the grace of God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. May you be with us today and all the days of our lives. May you be with those who need you in particular ways this morning, known to you, perhaps unknown to us, those you have burdened our hearts with, that we would pray for them and help them practically, and that we would know you, that we would receive you, that we would believe you, and that you would be with us in that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we turn back to uh, God's Word for a moment, this morning we're going to again sing, this time from Psalm 139a, verses 13 to 18 from the Sing Psalms. We'll stand and sing. For you, O Lord, created me, you hold me on your loom, my inmost being you have formed within my mother's womb. 
one-hit wonder of all time, in my humble opinion, would probably hark back to the 1990s, giving away my age perhaps, and it was by Chesney Hawks. I'm sure you all know it. You're all singing it now in your heads, aren't you? I am the one and only nobody I'd rather be. There is a sense in which, of course, that is correct, that we are all unique, that we are all individual, and yet, over against that, we are all the same. We have our own looks, though apparently in the world there is somebody who looks very, very like us, our doppelganger, they say. But we all have our own individuality, we have our individual preferences, we have our own characteristics, our own character traits, some better than others, our own personalities, our own idiosyncrasies. And yet, we're all human. We're all the same, made in the image and in the likeness of God. We all inhabit the human frame, albeit different sizes, uh, for now, for life. But the frame that we're in is in decay. It's failing us. The reality is that one day we will all die. Our bodies will come to the end of the road and we will be called from time into eternity. So in one sense, we may be the one and only. But on the other hand, we are all the same and therefore not wholly unique. However, there is one who is unique. There is one who is one of a kind, the only begotten Son of God the Father, Jesus. We know the verse, don't we? John 3.16, perhaps one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. And we know it in different ways depending on how we learned it or from what translation We learned it from, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His one and only, his only begotten. In in French they say his unique son. We pondered uh, the fact last week that many people in the world consistently get Jesus wrong. If there's one person, if there's one thing that people in the world get wrong, it is the person of Jesus Christ. He was a good guy. A historical figure that had some influence, a revolutionary in his day. No, no, no. He was the one and only. He was unique, the only begotten son of God. And that's what the author here, John, eventually came to understand and to realize. That Jesus Christ, this one who had called him and who he had spent three years in public ministry with, was God. John is an eyewitness to this fact. He'd seen Jesus in action. He had witnessed the miracles that he performed. He'd heard Jesus teaching with authority, the authority that nobody else had. He'd watched him die on the cross. He'd spent time in his presence after Jesus was resurrected. There's somebody at the door, John, we have a wee look. And so John affirms for us right at the outset of his book here the deity of Jesus as he begins to give us his gospel account under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He tells us, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, Jesus was alive and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That Jesus was the Word and that he existed, he was pre-existent. And we know that It's Jesus he's talking about because we come to verse 14 today, don't we? And what does verse 14 say? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we might begin to wonder at the outset of the book, the word was with God and the word was God. What does that mean? Here in verse 14, John makes it clear. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Not just words on a page, not just an inanimate thing, but the living word of God, the Logos, Jesus Christ. He, the personal pronoun, is used here. Now, when Jesus came into the world, we call that the incarnation, God becoming man. The world did not expect that to happen. They were expecting uh, something, but maybe not quite that, not God to show up in, in human form. Uh, The Jewish people were expecting a Messiah. They'd been waiting on a Messiah, one who would come and liberate them, perhaps politically, from the oppression of Rome. But they weren't expecting Jesus to come as a baby. They weren't expecting him to come as a child. They weren't expecting this. 
At the primary school, Chris and uh, CJ and others use walkie-talkies to communicate with one another. And you can ask them. There's some funny stories about groups of motorcyclists passing with their intercoms and speaking and it coming through on the, the radios in the school and thinking, who's talking to who? And uh, some, some things are good and some things are, are not so good. Uh, there's a story of a, a little church in America that was beside a, a highway and there was trucks passing uh, all the time. And as the trucks went past, sometimes their CB radios would interfere with the church PA system. Um, and there was this very dramatic evening when they were having a prayer meeting and somebody was praying out loud in the church. It was, it was amplified through the mic. Oh God, come and help us. And then they heard over the PA system, 10-4, I'm on my way. But essentially that's what God did in and through Jesus. He came to help us. He came to save us. And that impressed John. John realized that. He recognized it. And here's how we know that. Because in chapter 1 of John alone, John employs at least 13 different titles or names for Jesus. 13 of them. At least. Others say as many as 22. I can't quite reach 22. He calls him Jesus. He calls him Christ. He calls him the Lord, the Word, God, the true light, the Lamb of God, the teacher, uh, Messiah, the Christ, the King of Israel, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Billy Sunday, the professional baseball player from the last century who turned a Christian evangelist, wrote this. There are 265 names in the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suppose it's because he was infinitely beyond all that anyone could name, any one name could ever express. He was infinitely beyond all that any one name could ever express. John would say, Amen. I I agree with that. So here he is in his prologue, his introduction to his book. 1 through 18, these verses, is the prologue. And yet we come to verses 14 to 18, and it's the prologue within the prologue. It's the summary of everything that has already come to pass. And what John's motive here, what his desire, what his his purpose is in his opening verses of this gospel is that you would understand that Jesus Christ is unique. That he is the one and only. There is nobody like him. He is one of a kind. And the word that John uses here in the original Greek helps us in that because it gives that idea of only begotten, unique. Monogenes is the word in the Greek Uh, It appears in in verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son. So a couple of times, verse 14, verse 18, that appears. No one is like Jesus. There is nobody like him. He is you. And so this morning, uh, a few things about the uniqueness of Jesus, the one and only. Let's read verses 14 to 18 again, just uh, as we recap. And the word became flesh, John says, and made his dwelling among us, and we beheld his glory... The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son, who himself, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The uniqueness of Jesus, then. Number one, he was unique in his birth. Jesus was unique in his birth. He was like no other. It's fascinating, isn't it, that 2,000, over 2,000 years later, we are still celebrating him. We're still talking about him. We're still celebrating his birth every December, aren't we? The word becoming flesh. Jesus coming from the throne room of heaven into the dust of humanity. Him coming. The word became flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. You will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So what John's doing here, great passage for for Christmas, uh, but he's telling us the story behind the story, isn't he? He's saying, look, This is the Christmas story without even mentioning Christmas. 
The word became flesh. This is the behind the scenes information, if you will. What child is this? He says, the word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. We think initially when we hear that, the word is kind of impersonal. It's an unusual word to use. And yet it was so significant to the people of the time. It was significant to the Greeks. It was significant to the Jewish people. So that they knew without a shadow of a doubt who John was talking about the moment he used that word. That Jesus Christ was the living word. He was God incarnate. He was God himself. Hebrews 1, the writer says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. Jesus Christ, the creator, the sustainer, God. Notice what it says there. Does it say that he was born in in verse 14? Does it say that he was created? No, it says that he became flesh. Interesting, isn't it, when you begin to think about that? It doesn't say he was born. It doesn't say that he was created for this purpose. But no, it says that he became flesh. God, uh, John has already alluded to the fact that Jesus was pre-existent. That in the beginning, he was. But now that he became flesh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That it was done by him for us. It's a simple statement, but it's a profound fact, is it not? One of the most profound in all of history. The infinite becoming finite. The invisible becoming visible. Eternity being squeezed into time. The supernatural being confined by the natural. Was he ever confined? That's another trajectory altogether. The word became flesh. These four words pregnant with significance and real meaning. A.T. Robertson, one of the greatest Greek scholars of all time, said of this verse, this is beyond the power of interpretation. And yet we get it. Right? We can understand the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. He became a man. And yet when you begin to really think about that, your mind is blown. It's a simple fact that we take based upon evidence. That's why Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. Jesus appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by the angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up to glory. These are facts. Evident facts by those who saw it, those who witnessed it. John says, we beheld his glory. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The AV captures it maybe slightly. We have beheld his glory. The word that's used there in the Greek is theomai. It's what we get theater from. What do you do in that theater? You sit and you look, you gaze, you fix your eyes on something for an hour or, or two. It means the real meaning of the word theomai is to, is to study, to intently gaze upon something. John says we gazed upon him. We beheld, we saw, we witnessed, we experienced His glory. What we have to understand is that the the apostles, the disciples, they weren't a bunch of yes men. They they were those who had their own characters, just as we do. They had their own individuality, didn't they? Thomas was a pessimist, a doubter. I won't believe it unless I see it with my own eyes, he says. Peter was reckless. He was impetuous at times. He made claims and then failed to follow through them. He denied Jesus. Simon was a zealot. He he was a a, a terrorist. And yet they're all the same team. They're all called by Jesus. They're all being used by him. They're all being transformed as they spend time in his presence. Why? Because they beheld his glory. What did Jesus look like? Question we think of sometimes, don't we? We have lots of depictions. People, you know, this kind of thin... uh, Nice-looking, blonde-haired, halo-covered guy. Realistic? Unlikely. There's never a physical description of Jesus in the Bible. And yet, what do we know? 
We knew it was first century. We know he was a carpenter, a physical, hard job. Did they have uh, cranes? No. Did they have power tools? No. Was he working outside? Yes. Was he in the elements? Yes. Was he under the beating sun? Yes. Was he lifting heavy materials? Yes. We could understand that Jesus would have had rough hands. He would have had a strong physique. He would have been Middle Eastern, dark haired, probably with a beard. That's what he would have looked like. But the fact here is it's not important. The Bible says it's not important how he looked physically. What's important is who he was and what he did. And there's a lesson to us in that in the world of superficiality that we live in, isn't there? Not important what he looked like. It doesn't matter what he looked like physically. What matters is who he was and what he did. The word became flesh. Unique in his birth. Secondly, he was unique in his supremacy. Verse 15 is all about that, isn't it? John bore witness of him. John testified. John the Baptist testified concerning Jesus. He cried out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And we think, that's a really strange way of saying something, isn't it? Bear with me a second, we'll get to that. John the Baptist, again, speaking of Jesus, speaking of the unique supremacy of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He made everything. He sustains everything. He's the source of light and life. He became flesh. So John's exalting Jesus from the very get-go of the gospel here. And then he's bringing in John the Baptist as a witness to Jesus, one who testified uh, to Jesus, not only that he was unique in birth, but unique in his supremacy. Because remember, John the Baptist was a big figure, wasn't he? He was popular. He was a fiery preacher. He had a lot of people following him, interested in him. Some of them even thought that John the Baptist was the long-awaited Messiah. But he, tried, he burst that bubble. Listen, guys, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the one you've been waiting for. There are multitudes following him, according to Luke's gospel. All of Judea, according to Mark, came out to hear John the Baptist. He's a popular preacher, but what's he saying? It's not about me, guys. It's not about me. But it's about the one who's coming after me. The one who Jesus said of in Matthew 11. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So, He's popular. He's got a following, but even he is saying, look, as popular and as powerful and as great as I may be in worldly terms, I'm not supreme. But he is. The one who's coming. It's interesting how he says it, isn't it? He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Unusual. But again, he's appealing to the pre-existence, the deity, the divinity of Jesus. John the Baptist was older than Jesus. By six months. We know that from the Gospels, don't we? We know that he started his ministry, his public ministry, before Jesus did. I look, I know I'm older, guys. I know I started my ministry before this guy did. But what you have to understand is this one who is coming is not like anyone else that you have ever seen before. He has existed from before all eternity. He's supreme. It's really what it means. He's the only person who lived before he was born. Think about that one for a moment. He's the only person who lived before he was born. That's impossible, we say. It's absolutely impossible. He's the only person who existed before he was born. He took to himself humanity. He is the pre-existent God. He is the creator. There's problems with that amongst the religious people of the day. You think you're great? You think you're greater than Abraham, Jesus? Or did Jesus reply, John 8, 58, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Doesn't translate well into our English grammar, does it? But it's great theology. Before Abraham was born, I am. And the Jews knew exactly what he was saying by that and picked up stones to, to stone him, to kill him. Blasphemy, they said. You're making yourself out to be God. And he's saying, mm -hmm, that's exactly who I am. Supreme, unique in his supremacy. So here's the question this morning for you as we gather here in uh, Aleppo in, in May 2022. Is he supreme in your life? Here's John the Baptist. Greatest man 
who had lived up until that time. A notable man, a great preacher, famous. And he's saying, I've got something to tell you, and it's, it's all about him. It's nothing to do with me. I exist for him. I live for him. I serve him. I point you to him, the life giver, the one who comes. He is the supreme. So what of us who claim to follow Christ? Is he supreme? Or do we give homage to him once a week? Twice a year? How many? Or is he supreme? John said he's supreme and because he's supreme he deserves your honour. He deserves my honour. Thirdly, Jesus is unique in his generosity. Uh, Unique in his birth, unique in his supremacy, unique in his generosity. Verse 16, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace. John loves that word. Paul loves that word. We love that word, grace, that which we do not deserve being given to us. Out of his fullness he is given. Verse 16 is a difficult verse to translate when you look at the original language because of that word fullness. And here's why it's difficult. Because John never uses that word in all of his writings. Pleromatos is the Greek word. He never uses it except right here. But Paul uses the term. Paul uses it all the time. It's a favorite word of Paul. Paul uses it a lot. John never uses it. And what John is saying here is that Jesus is the unique channel of God's blessing to us, and it is based upon his grace. It's based upon grace, not what we deserve. Thank God. It's based upon grace, what we receive by his grace. Out of his fullness, we have all received what? Common grace. Everybody receives common grace. We are all in this room. Today, everyone in this village, everyone in the world is a recipient of common grace. What do I mean? Regardless of who you are, a believer, unbeliever, Muslim, Mormon, Catholic, Evangelical, Presbyterian, agnostic, atheist, you know, somebody who's apathetic, we are all recipients of common grace. We all have air to breathe, gravity to keep our feet on the ground. We all have uh, health and well-being, knowledge, uh, cognitive ability. We have bios. Remember the words for three words for life in Greek? Bios, biological life, psyche, psychological life. But we don't all have zoe, eternal life. We are all recipients of common grace, bios, psyche. But saving grace, saving grace comes when we receive and we believe Jesus Christ. We become a recipient of his covenant grace, his saving grace. Paul affirms this for us, Romans 10. So simple, the gospel encapsulated in a verse. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that he is the resurrected and living Savior, you will be saved. It's salvation. Not if you wear a hat. Not if you don't put your washing out on Sunday. Not if you do this or that or the next thing. If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. You will be given the Holy Spirit to make his dwelling within you. All of that is part of saving grace. So there is common grace, but there's also saving grace. Are you a recipient of one or both? Every single resource that we have or that we need to live for Christ is given to us, isn't it? Everything. Second Peter 1. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and godliness. Everything that we need to live a life pleasing to God is given to us in Christ by grace. You might be thinking, I've failed. I've failed spectacularly. Hey, join the club. Haven't we all? But out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already received. Grace on top of grace. 
Where there is grace, there is more grace. And where there is failure, there is yet more grace. It is limitless, inexhaustible, boundless. What then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, says Paul. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace. It's like standing at the sea, isn't it? You stand at the edge of the sea and you see the wave come in and go out. And then another wave comes in. And then it recedes and goes back out. And in and out. You stand there for an hour and it never changes. It keeps doing it. And you go away and you come back in a week and it's still doing the same thing. And you come back in a month and it's still doing the same thing. And you come back in 20 years and it's still doing the same thing. You come back to your grandchildren and it's still doing the same thing. Wave received. Wave received. Inexhaustible. Unending. That's a picture of God's grace. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already received. And continuing in that thought, what does he say? For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. See what he's doing? He's drawing a line between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant was the law. The law dictated to us where we're failing and how we falter. And how we're unable to keep God's righteous standard and his law. But then Jesus comes and he says, look what I give you. This is what I have come to do. Save sinners who are unable to save themselves. The law comes through Moses, but grace comes through Jesus. Under law, God demanded righteousness from mankind. Under grace, God gives his righteousness to mankind. Massive difference. We will never find another system of belief in the world which has this element built into it, grace. Religion is God's pursuit of man. Christianity is God's pursuit of man. Man's pursuit of God versus God's pursuit of man. What do we need to know? Bottom line, God loves us. Regardless of who we are, where we've been, what we've done, he loves us. He loves us, and he gave his son, his one and only son, the unique one, unique in his birth and in his supremacy and in his generosity, so that we might be free, so that we might be safe, so that we may be eternally secure. This is the gospel. This is Christianity. Dr. Karl Barth, 20th century theologian, one of the greatest minds on the earth, was asked once if he could sum up his life and his faith. And he said, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. A child's hymn, a child's song. So simple that a child can sing it, so profound that a theologian can base their life upon it. Fourthly, finally, very briefly, Jesus was unique in his clarity. Unique in his clarity. And what I mean by that is that if you want to see God clearly, you need to look at Jesus. No one has ever seen God, verse 18, but the one and only Son who is God, who is himself God, and in his closest relationship with the Father has made him known. There is no ambiguity here as to the identity of the Word, is there? Who Jesus is, none other than God himself, God the Son, second member of the Trinity. What does he mean when he says that nobody has seen God? He means that nobody has seen God. It's simple. Nobody has seen God in his pure essence. Nobody has seen God in his undiminished glory. We've seen, we've read of those, Isaiah 6, who had seen the glory of God and said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a people of unclean lips. But without Jesus, God would still be fuzzy, unclear, distant, obscure, opaque. Like looking through the bathroom window and trying to find out who's in the garden. Not possible. God is made known through Jesus, the one who was born. The one who became flesh. The one who gave of himself. Unique in birth. Unique uh, in supremacy. Unique in his generosity. Unique in his clarity. Jesus came in a way that we could understand. As a man, with all of the frailties of the human frame, he became like us and yet had no sin. Never thought a wayward thought, never said a bad word, never engaged in illicit behavior. An anonymous writer said, history is filled with men who would be God, 
but only one God who would be a man. A powerful statement, isn't it? Many people want to be God. But there's only one God who would be man. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, famous writer, mere Christianity, he said God, or the Son of God, Jesus, became a man that men and women might become sons and daughters of God. And that's the truth. That's the gospel here this morning. You are all, we are all the created of God. We are all recipients of the common grace of God. But if you want to know saving grace, and if you want to become a child of God, adopted into his family, given a place in his eternal kingdom, you will find that in Jesus, in Jesus alone, the one and only, the unique one. So that's the deal about this grace, this generous, unmerited favor. God gives us his grace when we believe his truth. And who is the truth? Jesus. If you don't believe Jesus, you won't receive his saving grace. You won't know his covenant of grace. You'll have air to breathe. You'll have good times that will last a while. But they'll come to an end. But if you receive and you believe in Jesus, the word who was pre-existent, the one who is unique in his birth, unique in his supremacy, unique in his generosity, and unique in his clarity, then you will have life, life eternal as a child of God. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for your grace. We give thanks for uh, the reality of Jesus. We give thanks for the evidence that shows us who he was and when he lived and how he lived and what he did. We give thanks that he was unique, that he was the only begotten of God, that he was the one and only one of a kind. We pray that we would look to him and that we would know life, that we would know not merely your common grace, but that we would know your saving grace. Bless us now, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude by singing from the hymn, Grace, let's stand and sing.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us all, now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.